Hey everybody, we're gonna do 5.2 today in remote. So I think the standard is probably one of the most simple concepts and it's gonna go so fast, okay? You're not even gonna believe it. So we're gonna look at what is called rural land use patterns. So if you've ever been on a plane or you've seen aerial shots, right? We see patterns across the land and we're gonna specifically look at farmlands, rural areas, right? And then that second part of the standard is going to discuss how we survey this land, okay? So let's go ahead and get started in your note sheet here. Um, oh, there's some uh, aerial shots there. So you can see how different the patterns look and we'll talk more about that in a minute, okay? So what I want you to do for the settlement patterns is you've got three kinds, cluster, dispersed, and linear. And I want you to kind of write the definition of those even though they're more on bulleted points. And then I want you to give me a little sketch. So this will really help you have a visual of what they're supposed to look like. So we'll start with clustered settlement. You need to know that this is a common settlement that's, that you'll see throughout Europe. And it does help create a sense of community. It's kind of a one shop stop. So you can see that out on the outskirts of this is farmland. And then you kind of have your little settlement here clustered together, hence why it's called clustered. Then we'll move over here to disperse settlement. This is what you're going to see more of a grid-like system, and it's going to be through North America. And this is more connected to resources in farmland. As you can see, it's very different from that clustered settlement. All right, and then the last one is linear settlement. And this is usually developed along a transportation system. So this could have been a river, this line here, or even a railroad. Okay, and we'll talk about some pros and cons in just a minute of those, okay? So if we look at the cluster settlement, I just really wanna quickly show you um, this overlay that, we, that you drew and now how it looks in um, real life, right? So you can t tell that this is definitely a clustered settlement. And again, this is what you see in Europe. Some pros is that everything is close together, but you do not have a good connection with your farmland. So people are having to make trips back and forth with that. Okay, the next, if we look at dispersed village, this is where the downfall of this grid system and spreading your settlements out is that, and you can see this without the overlay, as people kind of got tired of going back and forth to their farmland, so they moved more to this method. Okay, and then this last one, linear, remember this is a long transportation system. A downfall to this is it might, when you have this kind of linear from one end to the other, it can make it really difficult to communicate or even go get goods from one end of the settlement to the other, okay? And that's what the linear village looks like without that overlay. Pretty cool, right? All right, let's look at how these um, uh, patterns came about and how they're surveyed, okay? So again, I want you to write a quick definition and then a sketch. So meets and bounds is going to be mostly for short distances. And um, this is going to be figured through landmarks, and I'll show you a quick example. Then long lot is always going to have a relationship to a river. I want you also to put in your notes where these are found. We'll do that in a couple of slides. And then township and range, this is very much like a grid system, okay? And um, there's some other uh, sketches that you could use there. Long lots, there's just the lots and then the township just looks like a grid system with a square and then meets and bounds. Remember, can be kind of crazy weird, but it's going to again match like physical features or even structures. So let's look at a couple examples really quick. So this is where we have meets and bounds. This is, this again is drawn up when they survey this, it's based on like, like landmarks, right? So if we have my trees here, let's look at my little simulation. Then we have a couple of barns pop up, right? And so then when they go to survey that, right, they are definitely connecting that and making those boundaries based on those landmarks, okay? And if I lift everything up from the overlay, you can kind of see how they did that there, right? All right, this is our township and range, okay? Again, a grid system. And so if I pick this overlay up, right, you can kind of see 
that it would look more like this. And this is more common in North America, right? And so we see a lot of this, especially in the Western United States. Now this last one is the French long lot, okay? And then remember that this is usually based by a resource like a river that we see there. So if I set my overlay over there, you'll see my structures like my farmland and my homes pop up there and they're all kind of dispersed along the river there. Okay, Oop, let me go back. And I was gonna say, just note where the river and the road is here, right? And you can see that, that the, where those structures were put up as decided by the location of the liver, river and the road, okay? And so the objective here is to not, is to try to balance off those resources as an equal distance along a transportation system. Okay guys, that is 5.2, great job. And we'll catch you next time. Hey guys, we're here at 5.3 standard. This should also be pretty straightforward. What we want to be familiar with here is how plants and animals, where they came from and how they spread. So we're going to be looking at hearths or origins and then diffusion. Remember hashtag unit three, how things diffuse. That's the spreading of an idea. But in this case, it's going to be plants and animals. So in this first part of your notes, you have this chart. I am not going to read it to you. You're probably like, thank goodness. But I would be familiar with these hearths. Now remember, these are locations that you might want to be familiar with and what came out of there, what crops were cultivated there. So for example, wheat originated in the Fertile Crescent. So I would definitely know where the Fertile Crescent is and where did it spread? Okay, so it went to Africa, Europe, Middle East, and so forth. Okay, and you also have that map that you might throw a little color on and be familiar with that. Those big circled areas in that turquoise bluish is going to be your hearth. And then again, it'll have what crops came out of those areas. Okay, and then the little arrows are showing you where they diffuse. Pretty straightforward. All right, let's get into it. So in your notes, you kind of have a template set up of the concept and then the where and the what. So what I would do is just for the where, where it diffused or spread, and then the what would be specific things like in this case, it's going to be plants and animals, and I didn't get too specific with it. But for trade routes, you have Silk Road, and I do believe I forgot to put Indian Ocean trade on there as well. So you could just squeeze that on, but they're pretty similar. So the Silk Road brought, brought plants and animals. So that's your, your, you know, your what and where did it go? Uh, spread. So this red line is showing you the Silk Road. So it went from East to Asia and then spread into the Middle East and Europe. And we'll go back there and think it also mentioned Central Asia. The Indian Ocean also brought plants and animals. And I'll show you that route here is all in blue here. So you can see the uh, country of India was kind of the, the hub for all of those products going in and out there. And those spread um, to South Asia, Middle East, Africa, and even Europe. Now, the Columbia Exchange, I would also be familiar with. I, believe, I think there was an FRQ on the exam two years ago on the Columbia Exchange. Um, but as long as you're familiar with it, you should be fine. Now, this is specific and where as, as Mesoamerica and South America. That's when the Spanish conquistadors, after they conquered the indigenous groups there, they diffused again plants and animals to and from the area. So they took like corn, maize, squash, potatoes, and other crops from, um, from Mesoamerica and South America and took it to Europe, which is considered the old world. And in exchange, they took things from the old world and brought it to the new world, okay? Like coffee, sugar, horses, cattle, and such. And so this is just a quick little um, diagram I found. So the new world over here where the Americas are and what was brought over and then from Europe, um, the old world and what was brought to the new world. And you can see even diseases is mentioned there as well was brought over to the new world. Okay, and last, 
other um, forms of diffusion, you have migration listed there. And I would just say that like when you have people moving, they're going to bring over new foods and ingredients. And what you have happen is immigrants, wherever they left, they're going to want to replicate their their traditional dishes in their in their new home. And so that does create a lot of um, diffusion of foods and even spices. And then the green revolution, that is a revolution where we um, had just a lot of pesticides and new um, uh, technology was able to yield more crops. And with the green revolution, you also saw a new variety of plants replacing traditional crops, especially um, in places like Mexico and India. And these countries have seen actually a loss in genetic variety of plants. And then the last part there is just um, where you have increased wealth, you also have a demand for animal protein. Animal protein is a lot more expensive source of protein than say um, beans, legumes, um, and even nuts. And so when you have developing countries start to get more developed and get more money, they're going to start demanding that animal protein and specifically beef, pork, and chicken is listed there. The other thing that you can list under there is when you have McDonald's, right, globalizing across the world, McDonald's is going to also be seen in some of these developing countries and they bring new foods to those countries that they have never experienced before. So that concludes, I'm pretty sure, yep, that concludes 5.3. And make sure you bring your notes in so that you can get your points. All right, guys, check you next time. Bye. Hey, hey, here we are at 5.4. This is second agricultural revolution. So really all we're doing in this standard is talking about advancements um, that came into farming and the impact that they had. Okay, so before we start with some of these advancements, we just want to know that during the second agricultural revolution, it uh, happened alongside the industrial revolution that started in Europe. And it was a great time for that um, because of people moving into the cities and being ready to work. And so one of the reasons that the industrial revolution was happening in Great Britain in particular is because of the resources that were available and a lot of coal was available on hand in Great Britain. That's where coal was going. All right, this is a great chart to uh, be familiar with. It's in your AMSCO book, it's page 198 and it's gonna cover um, most of what we're going to talk about in this standard today that you're taking notes on. Okay, so let's let's start with some of the technology that came out of the second agricultural revolution. The first is a still plow. So what you're going to do on each of these is give the purpose of like just basically what it does. And then I'll tell you the effect that it had. Okay, so the still plow, this is what it looked like during the second revolution. Uh, agricultural revolution. This is what it looks like today. And you saw a lot of this equipment uh, being used in the documentary you've been watching in class called Feed Machine. And the purpose of this is to, is to clear the land. So this was, even though this still looks like, whoa, that's an advancement. Yeah. I mean, from taking a shovel and digging a hole, this really allowed um, clearing the land without hands because this was being pulled by usually a horse or ox. Okay, so that was a huge advancement. And the effect of this is it did reduce human labor. It was able to get through harder soils and it increased the amount of crops. It also increased the size of farms. All right, the second one is going to be the reaper or the harvester. And the purpose of this was it harvests the crops. Okay, so this is what it looked like um, during the second revolution. And this is what it looks like today. Okay. And so um, what the effect was from the harvester is that it did increase harvest and it also, again, reduced human labor. You're going to see a lot of that happen on all of these as an effect. And it did reduce crops that perished in the field before the harvest. Okay, so that's a reaper, also called harvester. This next one is a seed drill. So what this does is it actually plants in seeds. So it's digging a hole, planting the seed, and covering that up. 
So again, this is what it looked like in the second agricultural revolution, and this is what it looks like today. And the effect of that is, again, it's going to really speed up the process of planting and covering up each seed and also increase the yields that is produced. The last um, technology on your sheet is going to be the grain elevators. I'm sure you have all seen these when you've taken road trips. And these are storage methods. They usually obviously store grain. And the effect of this is that it would protect grains from like the environmental elements, like really bad weather. It would also protect uh, the grains from like animals getting into it and maybe even eating it. All right, so what we're gonna do in that second part of your notes is we're gonna discuss how these technologies really impacted some positives for humans. And the first thing you have there is food production. So obviously all of these advancements helped food be increased. And so this chart is showing the wheat yields in Europe from 1850 to 2014. But what I want you to notice is right here, see this spike? This spike is in 1960. So you see how it shot up and over here you see the yields like going from, you know, like two tons all the way up to six tons and eight tons. Okay. And so obviously the advancement allowed more production and more storage. So that's uh, again, a positive effect. And the next one is um, factory work. So because this second agricultural revolution was alongside the industrial revolution, this all happened for a, a reason because we had a, a time where advancements were coming out and we see machines replacing manual labor, okay? This next one's really interesting. It's the impact of calories consumed. And so if you look here right in between 1800 and 1850, we see calories by the average person per day go from about 1,500 to 2,000, okay? And again, all of this is because of this agricultural revolution and being able to produce more food. And so because we're able to produce more, people have more access to food, right? All right, now let's look at this last one, which is life expectancy, also pretty straightforward, but interesting, showing life expectancy. Here you see in um, the mid 1800s, people on average were only living to be about 35 years old. And what happens after the second agricultural revolution? We start to see exponential growth of people surpassing 60 years. And by the 1950s, they're um, even life expectancy up into um, 70 years old. So again, the uh, reason for this is we have more access to food impacts our life expectancy. Okay, guys, that concludes 5.4. Make sure you bring this in and get your um, points. We'll see you next time.